This must mean I'm on camera, yes? You people who are also on, can you, where it says on the bottom of the screen, ask a question, you can say, hey, Rick, is that really you? Or hi, my name is Helen, or whatever you want to do. Ellis is, I think, coming on. You see me, Lisa, okay. Well, it's a, it's a well, before Ellis comes on, I'm just gonna tell you it's a thrill for me to interview him. He's been a, a even though, all right, here he is. Sorry for that, I had a little technical question. Well, this is, Ellis, this is a world of technical challenges and technical uh, new things. I was just telling people that that uh, I was so happy to be doing this, not only because I just finished your, uh, really, it's an astonishing book, but because you and I share, we're, we're roughly the same age. We didn't go to high school at the same place, but some of our Chicago roots are, uh, are, are very, very similar. We did indeed cross paths in the building now occupied, uh, the sometimes daily news building on Wabash and the river now occupied uh, by a, monstrous building called Trump Tower. Yeah. Uh, what I want to do, Alice, before we get into the, the, the deep details of the book, uh, you were born and raised in Chicago. Uh, I was born and raised on the west side of Chicago, a place that no longer exists called the Henry Horner, the Henry Horner Housing Projects, and, and went to Lane Technical High School, yes. How, how did you wind up at Lane Tech? Um, very simple. I mean, I, I always test it well. And yeah. uh, and Lane was one of these schools you got into on the basis of having adequate test scores. Yep. You know, so so I tested well, and next thing I knew, I was in this school. All which it was then an all male school uh, yeah. on the north yeah. side of Chicago. You, had, you can tell people here you had to the men there, the boys there had to swim naked in the swimming pool. Did you not? You didn't have oh, to. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. This is this is an unbelievable scoop. Yeah, because I. Yeah, you're bringing back memories. Yes, you're right. Yeah, okay. I hope they're not terrifying <laughs> memories. Uh, but one of the memories must be uh, you. You did you read a lot as a kid because you seem to have been uh, in even in high school such a talented writer that one of your teachers in high school noticed that and directed you to one of the great writers in the history of Chicago, but also a great mentor of young people, Gwendolyn Brooks. What Did you have a sense, even in high school, that you had talent as a writer? It's funny you ask that, Rick. I mean, my worst subject in high school was English. Um, really? <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, for, a very, it was for a very specific reason. Um, a lot of what we did in English was to read short segments of things and then to answer questions to prove we had read it. And I found that just so utterly boring that I had fights with virtually every English teacher and I would refuse to do the assignments. And, and finally, my last year, um, my teacher said, look, Ellis, you're obviously bright. You're obviously you know, capable of doing the work. Why, why won't you cooperate? Why won't you do the assignments? And I said, because I find this utterly boring. And she said, well, okay, uh, what do you propose instead? Wow. No, no one had ever asked me that before. And I said, wow, yeah. that's interesting. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, isn't the purpose of this class to just decide whether or not I have a facility for the English language, whether I can research, whether I can write, whether I can support an argument? She said, well, sure, more or less. I said, well, then let me write something. And then you judge that. Uh, and she said, well, OK, well, what are you going to write? And as I said, I came from the west side of Chicago. I yeah. Mean, and I was a kid, you know, during the assassination of Martin Luther King. And so I lived through those riots, which in large measure. You saw, the measure, West, you saw uh, part terror. of the West Side. Yeah, you saw part of the I, West Side burn. Exactly. You know, and so I said, let me write a history of riots in America. Let me write about why people riot, where they came from. And for the first time, Rick, I got interested oh. in English, you know, and ended up turning in a 150 page manuscript to um, this teacher for this class. And so she comes to me, she reads it, she, she calls me up and, and, this is, and she says to me, okay, Ellis, I'm gonna give you an A in this course. She said, but I'm not really capable of judging this material. You need to take it to a professional. I said, well, a professional what? Who are you yeah. suggesting I take this to? 
She said, have, have you ever heard of Gwendolyn Brooks? I said, yeah, I've heard of her. She's the Port Laureate, whatever that is, right? She said, yeah. She said, well, she teaches at Northeastern College or University. She said, yeah, send it to her uh, and see what she says about it. So I'm this, then I was, I was then 16 because I had been double pro promoted a few times, but yeah, yeah, but I said, I said, okay. So I, so I send this thing to this woman, Gwendolyn Brooks. I don't hear anything. And I figure, well, what the heck, the poet laureates are probably busy people. Um, yeah, we, are, we, don't, we don't know quite what a laureate does, but they're gotta be busy. Yeah. Right. Right. But then I get a call from her Yeah, and I'm living at home, of course. And she says, you have to come talk to me. Oh. Huh. And so I said, okay, uh, where are you? And so I go meet her at the college. And this woman who I've been since, you know, man, before I met her, I, I read up on her and found out who yeah. she was. This very impressive woman who won a Pulitzer Prize, who'd done all these things. I said, uh, so, 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 she, so I sit down in front of her, kind of nervous. Yeah, and she has my, I guess you would call it a manuscript in front of her. She pushes it across her desk to me. And she's written across this manuscript about the history of riots that I wrote for this English class. And she's written across this, this, this manuscript, one day you will be a great writer. Oh my God, what a story. And I go, and I go uh huh. <laughs> you know? yeah, uh, no, of course, you're, sure, you're a kid. You're a kid. And so, wow. that was the, that was, so that was the beginning, you know, and, and to short circuit the rest of some of the rest of the story, I mean, I ended up, um, Furiously writing for you know a while after that, I produced a manuscript, a couple of manuscripts, um, and then I got very frustrated at the age of eighteen because I was doing all this writing and not making any money. None of it was getting published, uh, well, that, and so that's the case for most writers in this country too. Yeah, that and I decided, well, newspaper people get paid. Maybe I should try to get myself hired by a newspaper. So I so I read the Sun Times. Got the name Ralph Otwell was the managing editor then. Ralph Otwell, yeah. sure. Sure. Uh, I sent him several samples. By then I was in college, sent him several samples of what I'd written for. You were, at, you were at Circle Campus studying psychology, right. the intention of exactly. psychology. Yeah. And um, I sent him five sample columns. And um, again, did not hear anything. After about five weeks, I called up Ralph Otwell. I get, they, they put me through. And the conversation goes something like this. Well, Mr. Otwell, this is, you know, I'm Ellis Coase. Did you get the materials that I sent you? Yes, I did. Well, did you read them? Uh, yes, I did. Well, what did you think? Well, actually, you know, they're pretty good. Uh, well, great. So when, when do I start work? Uh, he says to me, uh, young man, why don't you come down and meet me? We, we need to talk. Hmm. And uh, so I get invited to this building on Wabash, 401 North Wabash. Oh, you're here. telling me, yeah. Um, I think it was the fourth floor. I mean, go I mean, with, absolutely with, uh, with with Mr. Otwell, and he basically says to me, "Look, kid, uh, you know you have some talent, and you and, and you clearly can write. So we need to figure out what to do with you. Um, what we should probably do with you is give you a job and let you figure out how, how newspapers work. So I have an I have a proposal for you, and I said, okay, what's your proposal?" He said, I propose we make you an editorial assistant. And you know what editorial assistant sure, is. Sure, you, know, sure. you, you answer, answer the phone, you, 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 you yeah, do various tasks. You get cigarettes for reporters. <laughs> so, yeah. but he said, but he said, but I'll make it more interesting. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we publish something called Viewpoint for Schools. And that goes to a population of about 50,000 students, you know, your age. You know, um, and it has various issues. I give you a column in that. You write that column once a week, and I'll pay you extra. I'll pay. I think it was fifty dollars. I'll pay you fifty dollars extra in addition to what we're paying you as an editorial assistant. So I said, okay, that sounds like a deal to me. So I so I happily took this deal, and then come the end of the school year. Uh, by this time, I think I become nineteen. Come the end of the school year, uh, I get called into. Um, Jim Hope's office. Jim Hope yes. is then the editor in chief. And, and Jim Hope like, always, always legendarily look like he's without a doubt the most handsome newspaper editor in the history of newspapers. But no, well, well, they called him the Golden Jet. I mean, I mean, he was a yeah. beautiful guy, uh, oh, yeah. and, and, and he seemed to be too young to be an editor. Exactly. I, I didn't realize who he was. So, so he calls me in, and but he's also kind of gruff. He calls me in. 
And he says, Kia, yeah, I've been reading your stuff. I said, uh, okay, well, yeah, he said, he said, I like it. I said, well, great, thanks. He said, well, he said, I, have, I said, I'll tell you what we're gonna do with you. I said, what are we gonna do with me? He says, what do you think of writing for the real newspaper? Whoa. Whoa. Um, and of course, like only uh, a naive 19 year old, you know, could process it. I said, well, you know, Mr. Hope, that's what I wanted to do all the time. Yeah. And he said, well, yeah. starting Monday, you have an op-ed column in the Chicago Sun-Times. So, I remember so that. Day. And then that began my new career. Well, and my father, who was on the staff of the Sun-Times, that came back and told me a few years younger than you, who's, you know, probably like a senior in high school and only interested in football and girls. And my father trying to say, Rick, there's an incredibly talented young man who started writing for the Sun-Times. I want you to read him. And I started, that is when I started reading you. One last question before we get into the book is being a child of Chicago, you talked about the West Side riots, uh, being a, a public housing child of Chicago, Ellis, how did, how did your childhood inform you about race? Because you write as articulately and passionately about the ever changing relationship of people and race in this country what were some how did it what the foundation of that you know what i mean you're a public well, well i think i know what you mean and, and and i think the only answer is that is that the way that my life turned out you know, sort of made me reflect on race i mean yeah. the very the very fact even when i was uh, a kid coming up uh, in Ch in uh, in the west side of chicago we had a uh, when i was a member of, the, of my church you know and we had a through the Methodist system, you know, they had twinned us with a, with a white church, you know, in upstate uh, Illinois. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and so we went to visit them, and I was maybe I don't know twelve or thirteen, and it was it was a, you know, we went to the suburbs, and there were these fancy houses, and it was all white, and 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 I'm going, my God, this is a totally different. Um, Sort of yeah. kind of place yeah. Uh, yeah. Than, than I'm accustomed to living in. And so why is this and why is this all white? Uh, and then of course, um, when I went to high school, you know, I ended up going to a high school that's 99% or so white. Well, they were, and there and, were 5,000 kids at Lane in those days. A, a, a huge campus, but you know, so, so you're forced to think about why would, uh, do we have a society organized in this crazy way where, where I'm in a neighborhood that's 99% black and the other the neighborhood that I go to school in is is ninety nine percent white, and, and and why is why are they so different, and and, and why are, are are the things that are available in these communities so very different? So from a from a very early age, just for those reasons, and and also, I mean, I was as you mentioned, I did read a lot. One of my early um, literary heroes uh, was you know James Baldwin. So I so I read about about this stuff and was trying to figure it out, was trying to work it out. And it just became part of um, part of so your much fight, part of your yeah. core. Yeah. L let me ask you. I'm going to, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the book that you should buy. This is the book you should buy. It's provocative. It's passionate. What do you think, Ellis Coase? The 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 First Amendment is now, I think, looked at. It, most people don't even know what it is, frankly. And it's mm -hmm. been views that it it almost seems like some dreamy utopian concept by the founding fathers that they couldn't have imagined the Internet. They couldn't have imagined Donald Trump. They couldn't have imagined television. The First Amendment has been since the 1700s beaten up and assailed a number of times. What what do you say in the first chapter of the book? You ask here. Yeah, I'll read a few things from the book. You ask. Uh, what is free speech? Incredibly provocative question. And you say here, you write afterward, the plain meaning is that government cannot tell you what you can or cannot say. That to me seems the ideal version of what those founding fathers had in mind, but it's been beaten up over the years. You do a remarkable job. This is not only is it a compelling read, but it is vivid kind of history lessons. I mean, this is a book that should be taught in every classroom across the country. Why does it mean, and now it's getting, now, frankly, and I guess I can say this because we're here, now it's really getting the shit kicked out of it, frankly, because of the internet. Uh, 
why is it why was it able to be so durable ellis and i think that people it was assailed you know even early on and you 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 take us through that what was one of the early dangerous assaults on the first amendment well before i even get to that and i'll get to it yeah i, I think when you ask why has it been so durable i think yeah, part of the yeah. an, part of the answer you know quite frankly is because it was largely ignored i mean <laughs> I mean, the, laugh, you're, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, as you correctly state, you know, the First Amendment has been with us, you know, since 1791, which is which is when it was ratified. But the reason it was not it was not part of the original Constitution, and part of the reason it was not part of the Constitution was there was a lot of question whether we even needed a Bill of Rights. I mean, you know, the First Amendment is obviously part of the Bill of Rights, and 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 whether we needed protection against a government that they were forming. I mean, they were they were they were concerned about protection you know, from England, but why would they need protection against their own government? So so there so there were a lot of debates yeah. about even the need yeah. for this. Um, and thanks to the Pride of Madison and others, I mean, they ultimately decided, okay, we ought to have a Bill of Rights. And and the First Amendment, of course, guarantees freedom of the of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of the speech, the freedom to petition the government. Uh, and that's a lot of freedoms that we have, and those are very important freedoms. But, Within less than a decade, uh, we passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, yeah. which basically made it illegal to say anything bad about the ruling Federalist Party, um, because we were concerned, and we were we were concerned that we, because of the of the European wars and the conflict with France, we were, we were concerned about so-called aliens and bringing in bad ideas. So at the same time, we made it illegal to, to to speak out against the government. We extended the, the time period that it took to take a citizen to, be, to become a citizen. And we had all we had all these restrictions on free speech. And so right away, you know, with, within the first decade of its existence, we said, okay, we got free speech, but let's forget about that. We have we have more we have we have more important things. Uh, like like protecting the Federalist Party and protecting the country to worry about. And that has largely been our attitude as a country yeah. until yeah. until the 20th century. I mean, right. the, other, the, the, the other thing I'll say in, in sort of getting, getting us to the 20th century, you know, is that throughout the 19th century, throughout, you know, and, and actually until, until 1925, um, the First Amendment did not even apply to the states. I mean, it was it, it specifically uh, prohibits Congress and by and by extension the federal government from imposing on your speech, but it doesn't. It then prohibit the states from doing that. You know, um, and as a result, um, if you wanted to advocate freedom for slavery, for instance, and publish abolitionist literature, right. you couldn't distribute it in the South. It was illegal. You, you 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 didn't have that kind of speech in the South because those were state laws. Uh, those were those those were not um, federal laws. Uh, so when you ask about why it's durable, I think part of that question is why did it finally become important, and why for a period of time did it become so sacrosanct? And if, and if you want to locate when it became important to us as American society, then you're really talking about that period right after the end of World War One. Right. Uh, right. And right. and 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 what happened during World War One? Was that um, the the um, government decided that it could not fight this war with internal critics? Mm -hmm. And there were yeah. plenty of them then too. Right? And there were plenty of them. I mean, so so you, so you so you had you know war critics were uh, arrested wholesale. I mean, the you, you had a guy who made a film uh, called Spirit of '76. He thought it was mm -hmm. a patriotic film. It was, it was it was it was a look of the American Revolution. He got caught up in in, in yeah, these I know you, laws that were passed. And basically, why did he get caught up in these laws? Because because there were there were, there were specific laws. I mean, there, there 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 was an Espionage Act. There was a Sedition Act, which was an amendment to the Espionage Act, which was passed in respectively 1917, 1918. Mm -hmm. But you know, but he but he was he was accused of violating these laws um, because in celebrating American independence, he celebrated. Our freedom from England, uh, and and he and he wrote about a um, you know an incident that shed that put England in a bad light. So he was there for criticizing an ally. He got sentenced to ten years in prison. You know, you know yeah. for that. You know, you you had the IWW, the industrial workers uh, union, uh, 
And the, the largest case up to that time, and I think still was held in a federal court in Chicago, um, when the Justice Department indicted 166 members of that union. Why, why were they indicted? Uh, the short answer is because they were anti-war. Uh, yeah, you, you know, yeah. Eugene Debs, the socialist, you know, who made a speech uh, opposing yeah, the war. He was put in jail. He was locked up in Woodstock for a while. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And finally got his sentence commuted, but he was put in prison. So, so you had that going on. And then right after the war, you had another uh, what seemed to be very scary period. Yeah, you, know, you had, you know, 1919, you had these bombs that were that were exploded around the country and, and various people in the government were targeted. Uh, and that was became the occasion for you know, the so-called Palmer raids, you know, mm -hmm. where the, where the mm -hmm. then attorney general arrested uh, thousands of people, locked them up, you know, who were suspected of being anarchists, who were expected of being anti, you know, anti-government, you know, in some way. Um, no connection between these people and the acts that had happened. No, no proof that they intended to do any harm to the government. But nonetheless, you get thousands of these people locked up. You know, and as a result of these kinds of, of behaviors, you also have, you have thousands of people deported. Uh, yeah. They, yeah. You know, they were just literally picked up and, and rushed through the process and thrown out because they were suspected of, of being anarchists or, or, or something like that. And you know, Emma Goldman was, was, was among them, and she was part of a famous uh, you know, that, that, or, 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 or a famous story where they took put hundreds of people on a ship and send it to Russia um, because we right. no longer wanted people. You know, so out of that, out of that, we, you know, grew the ACLU, uh, and, and, but also out of, out of that grew a whole series of court cases which began to question what in the world was happening here. And um, the whole theory that ended up supporting the First Amendment evolved from that. And more specifically, you know, Louis Brandeis, who was a member of the sure, Supreme Court, sure. I uh, wrote some brilliant opinions, basically making the argument that a democracy requires free speech, plus it's guaranteed by our constitution. And if you don't have speech, then you don't have any way to correct the bad things that are going on in a democracy. And he also made a crucial uh, judgment, which was, to, which was to argue that at the end of the day, good speech outweighs bad speech. Yeah. That um, speech that is peaceful speech outweighs truth, out, outweighs speech that isn't, and and this became a very very strong argument, you know, for the First Amendment. Now, now even even given that, I mean, it, it, it was somewhat a hard sell even for the Supreme Court because he made all those statements, you know, in a famous um, um, decision, nineteen twenty seven. Which, which which revolved around a woman, uh, Charlotte Whitley, in mm -hmm. California, who was in the Communist Party, and they were and they basically convicted her for joining the Communist Party, which because supposedly she believes certain things. Uh, right. So, right. And, right. and and interestingly enough, the Supreme Court, with this eloquent statement by uh, Brandeis, supported her conviction, but he made the argument anyway. Uh, I mean, and and, and in, in the same. Um, vain. Uh, there was a famous case in 1925. It was called Hitler versus New York. It, 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 had, it, it revolved around um, people, two men who had uh, published a, a, what, a, what they what was called a, some kind of communist manifesto in the newspaper, yeah. uh, and they were accused of violating again, violating the law. It was a specific New York law they were accused of, of violating, um, and. They got convicted. Their case went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court actually upheld that case, but then decided in upholding that decision to make a, a grander decision in some ways, which was to make the First Amendment apply to the states. You know, yeah. they, they, you, know, you know, they said, look, even though these guys violated uh, the law, even, even given their protection under the First Amendment, the First Amendment really does apply to the states. And this was a shocker um, because before that, like I said, it hadn't applied. Right, 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 right. Uh, do, you so, think, so, do you think, Alice, let me interrupt you for a second. First of all, to commend your astonishing research here 
uh, and to make those stories, many of which you've just been talking about, come to vivid life in your new book. Again, I will show you the short life and curious death of free speech in America. Do you think that when those decisions were made by the Supreme Court, do you think there was, and I hate to use this for Supreme Court justices, except maybe the contemporary ones, there, a, there was a little idealism there where they really did believe that we should have free speech because a good idea, it would enable a good idea to sort of triumph over a bad idea. And for, for real, and getting to contemporary times, for what is real to triumph over what is fake. Oh, absolutely, Rick. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you have to remember, you know, in the context of the times, who was talking about free speech back then? You know, it wasn't corporations. It, 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 it wasn't um, people on the far right. Um, mm -hmm. they, they weren't saying because they were perfectly happy with having these groups repressed and whatnot. They, they had no sure. sure. It was progressive. It, it, was, it was people who, who believed in labor unions and wanted to see certain things corrected as, as a result. Uh, it was people who believed that income equality issues should be addressed in some way. And, and, and it was people, it was people who believed in racial equality. It was people you know, who believed in, in, in sort of making society a more progressive place. So there was an association early on between the whole idea of speech and the yeah. idea of reforming society. And so there, so there was this sense that, well, of course, the more speech we have, because look who's look look who is really support, fighting for free speech. Right. You know, the more speech we have, the better our society will be, because people will exactly. hear these arguments, people will hear the the you know the, the, this reality about this reality, and they will act, and they will do things. And of course, as you say, that was that was before the age of advertising. It was before the age of uh, misinformation. It was it was be it was before. Uh, um, the age of uh, Swift Boat, uh, where where could you the, think about that for a second? That's one of the that was one of the most fascinating, compelling parts of the book. The whole people may have forgotten, and that's one thing. When Studs Terkel, our great mutual friend, used to say that America suffers from this collective Alzheimer's. Like, oh, you know, we got all Alzheimer's. We don't remember anything. Could you resurrect the whole? Because I think this is a seminal moment in free speech and the First Amendment and how it can be twisted. The whole, John Kerry was a more than viable presidential candidate, and then came Swift Boat. Yeah, he was also a Vietnam War veteran. Um, yep. and, and he was a bona fide war hero, if you believe. No question. He, was, uh, war. He, he had been, he had valiantly uh, you know, fought beside his men. He had saved people's lives. Uh, and what happened is that, and he ran, he was running for president. And what happened is that some Republican operatives Decided the truth isn't good enough here because the truth makes our make makes our opponent look pretty good. So mm -hmm. we need to substitute the truth for something else. Yeah. Uh, and they got they, they they got veterans you know to participate, you know, for various reasons. They got them to participate in, in, in ads and in a book and basically in a campaign to rewrite history and to make a war hero into a war criminal. You know, to, yeah. to, Make them to make someone who would who would perform valiantly into a coward, and before they were done, they had convinced a huge number of Americans that John Kerry was just the opposite of what he was. And and this and this was something that was a huge moment of insight for people who are involved in politics, and certainly for people who were involved in the politics in the Republican wing at that point. Of my of my God, you know, yeah. we actually can rework reality. We we, we can. Yeah. We, we can take the truth and make it into a lie and vice versa. And yeah. so, so I think it was a similar moment. It was, it was, a, it was a moment yeah. of the whole right. notion. I mean, I will look back maybe on someday, thanks to your book, as that being a, a such an incredible moment of, and if even inventing the word disinformation uh, or false information is kind of free speech seemed to be at that time kind of hijacked just hijack. Now I want to get us up. And ladies and gentlemen, all of those who are participating, feel free in about 10 minutes to ask a question. You can ask a question of Ellis. I don't know if, uh, because I don't know everything. I am so pleased to have heard about how you grew up here. 
because I did, I sort of knew that Ellis and I knew your relationship a bit with Gwendolyn Brooks, but it's important. So now I'm going to read something here. Well, I should also say before you, before you say that, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I have a, I had a soft spot, a soft spot for your father because he was, he was something oh. of a mentor to me. I mean, he, he would often take me aside and, and, and give me little words of advice about how to maneuver, you know, the, uh, the, the Sun Times system the, and, yeah, and the, the world. Politics, the politics of Chicago newspapers. Yeah. So uh -huh. here, he'd be so pleased. He would love this book. He would love what happened to your career too. And he would love a sentence like this. He's been dead for quite a while, but he would love, uh, he would love this. Uh, Donald Trump was certainly not the first wealthy person to decide that wealth entitled him to rule the world, but he perfectly embodied the ethos in style and substance that decency be damned. Everything, everyone is for sale. I do believe that the, the what punctuates the publication of this book, the official publication book being today, is what is transpiring in this country right now. It goes a along with your feelings about, and there's an amazing movie out. I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Social Dilemma yet. It is I haven't about, seen it yet. Oh, I, I watched it last night. It is about the darks, so and not the dark web. It is about how social media and it's Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat these things, Ellis Coast, are dangerous, are they not, to free speech? I mean, these are these are among the people. Well, I, well, 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 I, I wouldn't say that the their existence of the technology is dangerous, but I think that right. The, right. what the use. and the, and the use of it is certainly dangerous to uh, an informed citizenry, to having an informed citizenry. I will read here some. To you right there. That's why I love this book, I mean, ladies and gentlemen. I love this book. Uh, you write about going back to my friends, the founders. Although the founders were indisputably brilliant, they were not granted the gift of foresight. They had no way of seeing or imagining a republic where, at the highest level of political powers, truth is reviled and honor forsaken. They had no way of knowing that a process of selecting presidents designed to elevate the best of the best would denigrate the system for consolidating power in the hands of a moral partisan hacks. The First Amendment would be hijacked by hate mongers, propagandists, and opportunists more interested in despoiling democracy and degrading debate than ensuring that a diverse nation speaks in harmony. The internet age has shown us that free expression free expression can be poisonous. That is one of the principal points I think you make in this book and you make it so articulately and so beautifully. Are you fearful, Ellis Coase, of the future? I mean, you right here. Fear, fearful, is, I'm not fearful of the future, but I am very worried that the future may be very different than I'm one I would be comfortable with. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I think we have um, created a society where, which has, which which does several things that are very dangerous. Yeah, you know, I, I think it, it it squeezes out the ability of ordinary people to have much impact on anything, to have a voice on on what we're doing in our yeah. society. Um, it's skewed um, for reasons that go all the way back to the beginning, but it's, it's skewed politically uh, by anachronisms within our constitution that allow a Senate to be composed in such a way that one sixth of Americans representing the most unrepresentative states exactly. uh, veto anything that the other five, six want. Yeah. Um, again, that was not what the founders envisioned, uh, but that's what we have created. Um, and then we have an electoral college, which, which of course, um, also, because it's operate because because it's it's allocated according to Senate rules and 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 congressional apportionment rules, uh, is is not representative of the American people, and that that lack of representation becomes distorted because it's undergirded by a winners take all philosophy in all but two states, you know, and yep. and so so we have so we have in place several things that are impediments to a real democracy. And several facilitators of the worst things that exist 
in us. You know, we 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 yeah, we we have incubators of hate and yep. intolerance um, yep. on the internet, um, and all of this was something that was never foreseen. Yeah, and uh, could be it it when you watch. Here, here's a question. We have a question, and Alice goes for you. What do you think is the most effective form of action that we can take to help get our voices heard? That's a, a boy, I'm at a loss for an answer. Um, well, we have an election. So, so I think, I think yeah. on, on, on one hand, you know, the answer is obvious. I think, I think we need not take for granted that just because a, a person who was particularly intolerant of um, free speech um, is losing in the polls. That means he's going to lose. I, I think we yeah. need to take it as a as you just it, because it all comes back to that goofy electoral college. That's why presidents used to presidential candidates used to go out and visit many different states in the country, and now they concentrate on those so called battleground states. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and 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 that and, and for reasons I won't go into here because it takes too long. But I mean, I think the disappointing impact of the electoral college has only increased. I mean, you know, before the year two thousand, the last time we had a popular vote that didn't agree with the electoral vote was eighteen eighty eight. You know, um, and the the, the only the, the time before that was eighteen seventy six, uh, which 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 was um, you know which 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 basically you had with the compromise of, of 1877 that ended reconstruction and ended up any hope of, of, of racial equality in the United States. But it was it was a rare thing until now. I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily going to be rare going forward be, because uh, of demographic patterns and because of the winner take all uh, approach, you know, to voting. So 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 there so there is that. But in terms of what we can do, um, I think we as a society need to pay a lot more attention to how judges get appointed. We need to insist. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. Be a, a lot more rigorous in what it, what it approves and 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 who it doesn't approve. Um, and we need to be about what's happening with voting. I mean, yeah, we're we're seeing before our eyes a major effort at um, voter tampering and voter suppression taking place at both the federal and at state levels. Um, yep. And we need to stand up to those things because they are going to fundamentally change what kind of society that we can be. Yeah. You, you and your wife live in Manhattan. I know you're in New York. New York City. Yes, on the Upper West Side. Uh, how's New York City uh, coping? With COVID? Uh, well, I mean, it's... it's, it's oh, with, with, uh, with COVID, and everything COVID is on life. Yeah. Uh, well, like like so many places, um, you know, we're largely shut down. So what yeah. the the special things that make New York what it is are no longer things that you can easily enjoy anymore. I mean, there's no Broadway. Yeah, yeah they, they, most of the restaurants are either shut down or serving um, outside you know, in, in, in a limited way. Um, the, the whole New York social scene is pretty much uh, gone at this point. So a lot of people are just in the city, um, but we're doing compared to most other states. You know, we're doing well. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Because you're, well, because both New York and uh, whatever whatever the president of the United States may think of these two guys, they've got we've got uh, there are good governors in both of these states, and J.B. Pritzker right. and Cuomo out there. Uh, you, you must. You were obviously now on the. If you want to say book promotion tour, that's another thing that they, <laughs> you would be booked into libraries here. You'd be talking at the Harold Washington Library. How do you find I'm finding this whole scene. It, it, it works. And this has been a marvelous, wonderful conversation. But it's for an author. And I've written a few books and you've written many more. There, There is something really so wonderful about interacting with readers, isn't there? Well, you 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 know you unfortunately lose that 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 sense of spontaneity, yeah. that, that 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 sense yeah. of involvement with a real community. Um, you miss that, and 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 certainly as as um, I think we mentioned earlier, I published a book a couple of months ago, which was the history of the ACLU. Um, yeah. And now, and and if if that had been in pre-COVID times, we would have had events at, at every ACLU chapter in the country. We would have had we would have had large gatherings. Um, but we couldn't do that, uh, so we had to do remote events, you know. And then, and then with this one again, we would have we would be having a, a physically 
uh, oh. a physical tour where you go and you meet people and you get to you talk to people. people. And, and, and you actually, <laughs> yes, and actually, it, it's called human intercourse, everybody. <laughs> well, for, uh, I want to ask one last question. I'd like you to talk about it for a while because you mentioned the ACLU and do when you buy this book, you see it, you see the cover of it. I'm holding it up as best I can. It's like, there it is. It is not a long book. It's easily digested and it will stay with you forever. And it will help you think in a smarter way about the way we live now. I'm so curious to hear you talk about the ACLU and Skokie many years ago. I still think that is one of the most interesting, I'm not gonna call it a conflict, Ellis. I'm gonna call it an encounter between the ACLU and the suburb of Skokie when a group of uh, crazy, of course they're crazy, they're Nazis, uh, wanted to march. Right. Uh, it was a very important moment in the ACLU's history. And, and, yeah. and, what I, and what I should just reference even before that is that long before this happened, the ACLU institutionally had taken the position that it was not their job to pass judgment on the content of speech. It was of course, their job no, of course. that's why I love the ACLU. Yeah, exactly. To protect the, you know, the right of speech. You know, and so going back to the 1930s, they published a pamphlet. Because people had a hard time getting their heads around this idea. Well, why are you protecting these KKK people? Why are you protecting yeah. you know, these, these hateful individuals? And so they published a pamphlet in the mid 1930s uh, called, you know, why we defend, yeah, should the ACLU defend Nazis? Uh, yeah. and, and, and in that pamphlet, they articulated their point of view, which, which essentially boils down to, if you're going to defend the speech of folks on the left and their right to speak, you can't do that without also defending the right of some of these hateful people, these people that sure. most people hate to speak. And so it, so it always had this sort of ecumenical view of speech. And so yeah. when the um, when the Nazi group came to the ACLU and says, you know, Skokie has passed all of these ordinances, which are specifically designed to block us from having our gathering. They, you know, they say you can't wear certain kinds of uniforms, you can't, mm -hmm. have, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But they're really aimed at us. Uh, will you help us? Uh, for the ACLU, uh, it was a non-controversial decision. You know, they said, well, sure, you know, this, this, this is what we do. Uh, yeah. What they uh, what they hadn't reckoned with, you know, is that there was you know, first of all, Skokie, as you know well, and, and those days was, oh. was home to, to many Holocaust survivors. Many uh, Holocaust so, survivors who didn't didn't speak of the Holocaust. They, they were it was a sort of they did not you know there was no Holocaust museum. There was a one little storefront. They had come to Skokie to leave it behind and forget it. Of another thing. And the idea of Nazis being allowed to march down the street oh, yeah. that the ACLU would defend this, they just couldn't understand. So it became this major national controversy. Um, thousands of people you know, wrote in to complain. Thousands of people in, invoked their membership, uh, said they were leaving. It, it became a crisis you know, for, the, uh, for the ACLU institutionally. Um, and they ultimately, you know, one of the ways they got around it was to have a, a guy named David Goldberg. Sure. Who, who was who was a, uh, a a lawyer, the lawyer who defended the case, ultimately authored a letter, which became the most successful fundraising letter in the history of the ACLU. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which made the argument said, "Look, I'm a you know I'm a Jew, and I don't like these people either. Uh, but the reason that I'm defending them is because in defending their right to speak." I'm also defending the right of, of civil rights workers in Selma to speak. You know, that the same kinds of laws that were passed in Toki to block them, they're trying to pass in these other places. And if we let it stand here, we can't oppose it there. You know, so that's why we, we need to understand that it's not about supporting Nazism, which we don't support at all. You know, and, and, and in fact, he was insistent when, the, when they wrote Nazis in the letter that they not even capitalize it. He said, I won't sign so a letter cool. if we capitalize so, it. Yeah. So cool. Nazis. So cool. Uh, uh, that is one of the reasons I love the ACLU and the way your passion and your intelligence and everything else he brings to your books is one of the reasons I love you. And I wish we had 
I wish I wish I had been a couple years older, and then I could have worked with you at the Sun Times, and we could have gone to the Billy Goat every day. <laughs> uh, Ellis Coast, and uh, those of you listening, and those of you, I will be uh, using our conversation here as the basis for a story about you. And uh, wonderful. Otherwise, we'd been doing 10 stories because you would have come to Chicago for about eight different events. Uh, Ella, you and your family keep safe and be well. All of you who listened uh, or watched or whatever you do in these crazy machine times, buy this book. There, you can see the whole title. Buy this book. Ellis, continued success. And uh, as my dad used to say, onward. Okay. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. My real pleasure. Mine, too. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know if we have to do is figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> I think we can figure that one out.